preachers preached and our ladies prepared a wonderful meal that there's nothing compared to eating that spiritual food from the word of God. And uh, Brother Carper has been uh, preaching the word of God. I like it. There's no substitute for the preaching of the word of God. And uh, I love it. You just don't, uh, uh, to me, there's no substitute. Uh, singing, I enjoy and love. It's like salad to a good steak. And the steak is the word of God. The salad is the lettuce and the tomatoes and the onions and carrots and cucumbers and all that with the uh, French dressing on it. And, and uh, uh, that's good. But boy, when you cut into that filet mignon that's been wrapped in bacon, now you're doing something. And that's when you get into the word of God. And it has really been an honor and a blessing. I love Bible conferences. Uh, you just open up your Bible and follow the man of God, and you'll get something if you come looking. And if you come hungry, you'll certainly get fed tonight. And it's an honor, and I mean that sincerely, to have one of God's choice servants, Dr. Benny Carper. I want him to come. And speak to our hearts. We're so honored that you're here. I'm honored to be here. God bless you. All right, let's open our Bibles again to the book of Ephesians tonight. The book of Ephesians, chapter number one. And I appreciate all of you for being here tonight. And uh, I'm, I've been a member at Mountain View Baptist Church for over 15 years. I don't get to go to my church often. I mail my tithe in every month. But I'm on the road. So much preaching. But Jimmy Robbins, whenever he was, he pastored there 40 years. And on Wednesday night, though, he would count off, find out how many were in prayer meeting. And uh, he had that down to a science and had his people trained. We'd usually have 200, between 230, 260 for prayer meeting. And he'd say, all right now, all right, praise God, we're going to count off now, count off. And he'd start over here, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And some of the fathers that had little children would go, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16. <laughs> when I was in college, I had a, had a professor, and uh, he didn't, you didn't have a name in his class. You had a number, and he'd assign you a number at the beginning of the year, and he didn't call roll. He said, all right, let's take a roll, and whoever was number one would say, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Where are you at, seven? Seven. Absent. Go ahead. Eight, nine, ten. <laughs> so anyway, I thought about that when Brother Sturgill was having everybody count off. If, if y'all do that some, y'all get used to it and you get to where you can do it real quick. There's a lot of humorous things go on in church circles because the church is a family. And a lot of funny things go on in our families. And uh, certain things that I, can, uh, I enjoy teasing my children with. And uh, sometimes we can do that in the church as well. I'm using chapter 4, verse number 1 as a text. Of course, we'll get there tomorrow night. I therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you that you walk worthy of the vocation wherewith you're called. And you and I are born unto a walk. So by the grace of God, we want our walk to be worthy unto the vocation wherewith we're called. Now, I could preach on that and develop it, and it would be interesting and inspirational and informative. But it doesn't have the meaning that recognizing what the word therefore, which is the basis of our worthy walk. I therefore, based on what I've said in chapters 1, 2, and 3, on that foundation, I'm asking you, I beseech you, to walk worthy of the vocation with your call. Now, whenever you and I read the first two chapters of Ephesians, we discover that there are ten birthrights every born-again believer has. If you've been saved for five days or five months or five years or five decades, it doesn't matter. Every born-again believer has these birthrights. 
You have them whether or not you understand them. I didn't have to understand the biology of a human birth to be born. And I didn't have to understand the different blood types and the operation of the blood to be alive. And I didn't have to understand that oxygen is carried into my lungs and then into the bloodstream for me to maintain life. But all of that happened when I was born. And whether or not I knew it or understood it didn't make any difference. It was a reality. And so it is with these ten birthrights. You may live your Christian life and never understand these great things, but it doesn't mean you don't have them. But if I, if I have them, I'd like to understand what I have and whereunto I have been born again. Now last night we saw three of these birthrights. Verse number three. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. You and I that are justified are already blessed. Now understand when my brethren say, pray for me that God will bless me. I prayed today for God's blessing to be upon this day and for God's help as I try to deliver his word. Of course we want the blessing of God, but the fact remains, we are blessed. And that is the operation of the grace of God. Under law, they labored toward a blessing, whereas under grace, we operate out from a blessing. And that can be seen in the law of the Sabbath, which we are not under. The Old Testament saints, the people of Israel rather, uh, at Mount Sinai, there's a period of 2,500 years from Genesis chapter 1 to Exodus 19 when there was no Mosaic law. And now for 2,000 years, we've not been under Mosaic law. We're not under law, we're under grace. But under law, the children of Israel labored toward the Sabbath. They started out on Sunday, which is the first day of the week, and labored down to a Sabbath of rest. But in grace, we worship on the Lord's Day, the first day of the week. In fact, some of you do the most of your work on the Sabbath day. You fly your field, and mow your lawn, and chop firewood, and we do all those things on Saturday, which is the Sabbath. So under law, they labor toward blessing. Under grace, we go out from blessing the first day of the week. So every born again believer is blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. It is unbelief that blinds your eye to the blessing of God in your life. Then number two, second birthright, according as he hath chosen us in him before the foundation of the world. I don't understand all of God's eternal counsels. Dr. Oliver Green used to quote Deuteronomy 26, 26, the secret things belong unto the Lord our God, but the things that are plainly revealed to us. And there are some things that we just don't know. I read in the Bible that I was chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. I am not going to deny that. And that does not make me a Calvinist to believe that. Don't call me a Calvinist. You'll reveal your ignorance. I don't accept covenant theology. So I can't be a Calvinist. But I'm not going to deny to God his right to choose among men. Now if anything ought to put a note of humility in our heart and in our mind is the fact that out of the billions of people that are on planet earth, they say seven and a half billion people. I heard my grandfather preaching the other night a sermon from 1981 on the radio. He'll be on the radio tonight at 11. I'll get to hear him going home tonight at 11. He'll be on the radio tomorrow night at 11. I'll hear him again. And he was preaching and he said, there are four and a half billions of people on earth. And I said, Papa, if you could be alive now. There's seven and a half billion now. And out of all those seven and a half billion people, the grace of God has reached you and me and here we are tonight justified by grace through faith. That wasn't an accident. God had that worked out on the other side of Genesis 1. 1. I cannot explain that. But I thank God for it. And I believe it. 
Then again, number three, having predestinated us. And you and I do not live by luck or chance or circumstance. You and I that are justified by the grace of God live by predestination. And that simply means to determine beforehand. God has the details of our lives already worked out. I don't expect to live one day longer than God has ordained for me to live. Now, I don't want to be a fool, Ecclesiastes 7, and die before my time. But there's a date on the calendar when I was born, time to be born, and there's a date on the calendar out yonder in the future when I'm going to die, and I expect to die then. That's right. Hezekiah pled with the Lord. God gave him 15 extra years. And in that 15 extra years, he produced another son by the name of Manasseh. And that boy was, was the clone of the adversary of the devil. That was a wicked, vile man. And Manasseh was produced in that 15-year reprieve God gave Hezekiah on his life. Now, none of us want to die, but it's hard to be frightened with heaven And the longer I live, the more of my kinfolk I have over there than I have here. I have an idea, I'll feel right at home over there. Amen. So there's a time on the calendar that I'm going to die. And when I get to that date, God will give me dying grace and I'll check out here and I'll check in over there. Dad will shake my hand and Grandmother will shake my hand and granddaddies, both of them will shake my hand. And I have two children over there that my wife uh, could not carry and I've never met them. And my dad's beat my time. He's already over there with two of his grandchildren that I've never met. Now I expect a little time to get caught up with them. Amen. They're just as real as the two I've got here. Now you and I that are saved by the grace of God live by predestination. God has the details worked out in advance. Our lives are predetermined. In 2 Corinthians 5, and I, I can't get bogged down on this, but you and I that are justified have a new standing before God. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That didn't say everything has passed away and everything has become new. It said all things passed away all things, not everything, all things. Some of y'all live in the same house you lived in before you got saved. You still live in the same house. That didn't become new. That has to do with our standing before God. I'm not an alien anymore. I'm not a stranger. I'm an heir and a child and a son. But in that passage, Paul the Apostle says that we should not live unto ourselves. The fact of the matter is we don't. That text didn't say that we should not live selfishly. That verse didn't say that. Of course there are selfish Christians. But no believer lives unto himself. God has a way of shutting doors and you'll never get them open. And God has a way of opening doors and I don't care if the whole world's against you, that door will never be shut. Now that's a part of the operation of God's providence, of God's predestination. One preacher said it like this, I've never heard it said better, there are no accidents with believers, only appointments. It's an interesting way to say it. So you and I, as a born-again believer, the area of predestination has begun to work in our lives. And you and I can rest recognizing that God is in charge. If you get laid off from your job, that didn't catch God by surprise. might have surprised you. didn't surprise God. He knew all that out yonder. My grandfather used to say, has it ever occurred to you that nothing has ever occurred to God? He didn't have to read it in the newspaper. So we live by predestination. Now, this area of predestination, watch the rest of the verse, verse 5, is in, uh, in the area of adoption. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself according, there's one of those 16 accordings, to the good pleasure of his will. 
You and I that are born again are members of a body. A body is a many-membered organism. But if all the body were ears, where would be the smelling? And if all the body were noses, where would be the seeing? And if all the body were eyes, where would be the hearing? So my body is made up of many organs, none of which are a body by themselves. A liver is not a body by itself. Lungs are not a body by itself. But you put a liver and lungs and a heart and five quarts of about to say all, blood in your veins and get the neurons firing right in your brain and get your eyes working and the first thing you know, you got a walking, talking human being. God has placed us in the body where he determines we're needed. Now, a lot of things haven't worked out like I thought they would work out in my own experience. I, when I was in college, I took all pastoral studies. I, I said, I'll never call myself an evangelist. I assumed by this time in my ministry, I'd have been pastoring for 20 years. I don't preach like an evangelist. I understand that. I preach like a pastor but I've not pastored an hour in my life. Oliver Green didn't pastor either, neither, neither did Jack Green. I heard a preacher say one time in a fellowship meeting, he said, well, all these evangelists are a bunch of pastors that couldn't take it. I got a corrupt nature. I want to give him one of those cross chops. I said, man, if you only knew. Now you go home every night to your wife and children, and I'm laid up in some hotel trying to figure out what city I'm in. My dad used to ask me, he was like, what'd you preach on last night? And I said, no, wait just a minute and I'll tell you. Wait a minute and I'll tell you. Give me a few minutes and I'll remember. Well, where were you last night? I said, well, <laughs> let me think about that and I'll tell you that as well. Now, I always thought I'd pastor a church. But I hadn't pastored a day in my life. But I have 40 meetings booked this year. And I didn't get on the phone and drum those up. Now, I don't know how that happens. I had a young preacher who was in Bible school, and he said, I want to take you out to eat. I need to talk to you. And we went out and sat down, and he looked across the table and said, I want to know how to book revival meetings. I want to be an evangelist. And I said, well, I can't help you. He said, well, well, you got a lot of meetings booked. I said, yes, sir. Well, how do you book them? I need to know. I said, I don't know how to do that. And he never could get it in his mind that I didn't know how to do this. This is what God has done, but it didn't work out like I expected. I didn't expect this to happen. I expected to be the pastor of a local church. But in predestination, God has put me in the adoption of sons where he wants me. And I'm not grumbling or complaining. I am grateful for what God has done. I hope I have enough spiritual discernment to recognize that this is the will of God and in that I'm to give thanks. You see, predestination. Now look at the next verse. Now this is done. God doesn't always operate according to our schedule. This is done to the praise of the glory of his grace wherein he hath made us accepted in the beloved. Every born again believer is accepted. I've not always been acceptable, but I am accepted. Now look at the fourth birthright. I must hasten. Verse number seven. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Every born again believer tonight has redemption. If you have been saved by the grace of God, God has redeemed you. And you and I are redeemed not by the elements of this life or the works of the flesh. We are redeemed by the blood of Christ. It is the blood of Christ that stands sufficient in the payment of our sin debt. Now the wages of sin is death. You go into a store and you say, well, how much is that? And the man says, that's $20. Well, how much is that? The proprietor says, that's $50. Well, 
You say, well, how much does sin cost? And God says, it'll cost you your life. The wages of sin is death. That's how much, that's, that's the redemption price. And that is exactly what Jesus Christ did for you and me. He went to Calvary, set his face as a flint. Revelation says that he's a lamb slain from the foundation of the world. He was born crucified. And Jesus Christ died. He died to pay the price. That's what it cost. Death. And that's exactly what Jesus Christ did. Now, in his death, he shed his blood. Now, you and I are redeemed by the blood of Christ. He died in order to shed his blood. But if he had made a bloodless offering, none of us would have been saved. Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. They didn't say of sin. There's no remission of anything without blood. We are redeemed by the blood of Christ. Now, obviously, if I'm redeemed by the blood of Christ, I'm not redeemed by anything else, by water baptism, church membership, living a good life, turning over a new leaf. I hear this a lot, getting your life changed. Come get your life changed. It's a common colloquialism that I hear a lot now. You don't need your life changed. You need your soul saved. You can go to the doctor and doctor say, boy, you got cancer. That'll change your life. My dad died of cancer. My dad's sister died of cancer. My dad's older brother has cancer. Don't you think that's gone through my mind more than one time? My mother's a cancer survivor. There is no heart disease in my dad's family. If you don't die of cancer, you'll live. My granddaddy lived to be 88. My grandmother lived to be 93. So if I don't get cancer, I'll live a long time. But cancer runs in our family. I've thought about that. You get cancer, that'll change your life. That'll change everything about your life. You let your spouse die or a parent die, that'll change your life. You don't need your life changed. You need to be born again. And man is born again by the shed blood of Christ. That's how our sin is put away. Now notice there's something in this passage and I want you to see this. And I don't have time to develop it. Lord knows I just, the, the, the time gets by so fast. I mean so fast, time gets away from us. In whom we have redemption through his blood. Now watch it. Comma, the forgiveness of S-I-N-S. According to the riches of his grace. Now, you've noticed sometimes when you read the Bible, you read S-I-N-S, and other times you read S-I-N. There's a reason for that in a King James Bible. Keep your finger there and turn to 1 John for just a moment. 1 John. If you have a Schofield Bible, this will all be uh, on the same two leaves. You won't have to turn back and forth. Page number 1322 if you have a Schofield Bible, 1322. In verse number 9, chapter 1, 9, if we confess our S-I-N-S, he is faithful and just to forgive us our S-I-N-S and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you look over at 1 John 3, 9, and the text says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin. Now, I disagree with the Schofield Bible at this point. Beside the word commit, Schofield has an F. If you look at a center column reference, he says that the word commit means to practice. I cannot agree with that. The reason I don't agree with that is if the word is changed from commit to practice, there's a contradiction in the verse. Let the King James Bible read as it reads. Don't monkey with it. Now, this passage gives believers some heartburn sometimes. They say, Brother Ben, I know I'm saved. I know I'm saved, but I know I sin. And 1 John 3, 9 says, if I'm born of God, I can't sin. Now, am I really saved? Well, look 
at the words. The words are not the same. In 1 John 1, 9, it's S-I-N-S. And in 1 John 3, 9, it's S-I-N. S-I-N-S is what I've done. We've all committed sins with the flesh or the spirit or the mind. Now I'm running some of these Pharisees and I'm just call it like I see it. I'm burned out on Pharisees. They wouldn't take a pinch of snuff. Now I don't use tobacco of any kind. So I'm not defending something that I do. I took my first chew of tobacco when I was 13 and I rolled it around in my mouth and I knew just as soon as I chewed that up and spit it out, I was going to want some more. I thought that's peppermint candy. I don't use tobacco of any kind. I haven't used tobacco for decades now. Just I'm telling you the truth. Now they wouldn't take a pinch of snuff. But they're full of so much self-righteous piety and arrogance, you can't stand to be around them. Don't come nigh unto me, I'm holier than thou. Stay away. Where I walk is holy ground. I want y'all to know. Get back, get back. Don't come close to me. You can go jump in the French Broad River as far as I'm concerned. God hates pride. He never said he hated red man chewing tobacco, but he said he hated pride. I'm trying to draw an illustration. Now listen to me. Every one of us have committed S-I-N-S with my tabernacle. I've had bad thoughts. The thought of foolishness is sin. How many foolish thoughts have I had? That which is not of faith is sin. How many times have I been manipulated by doubt? Amen now. Sins are what I've done, but sins send nobody to hell. S-I-N is what I am in Adam. And when Jesus Christ died, write this reference down, Romans 6, 10. In that he died, listen now, listen carefully, I'll quote it exactly. In that he died, he died unto S-I-N once. That's all it took. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God. Christ will never die again. If you're born again, S-I-N cannot be charged to your account because you're in Christ and Christ is in you and sin will never be charged to Jesus Christ's account. For sin to be charged to me, Christ would have to go back to the cross. So if you're born again, you can't sin because you're in Christ. But that doesn't mean that my corrupt nature has been eradicated. It has not. So I get in a bad way sometimes and I have to find a place to pray. I think repentance has a whole lot more to do with a born again believer than a lost sinner. A lost sinner doesn't know how to repent. We would all agree repentance is a good thing. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. How's a lost sinner going to do a good thing? Great day since I've been born again, I've done a lot of repenting. You find you a place to pray and get in the closet or go out in the woods or get in your car. Amen now so nobody can hear you and you lay it all out. God have mercy on me. Oh God, have mercy on me. And God will wipe those sins away. S-I-N-S, forgive you. All right, now when I got redeemed, look back now, S-I-N-S, S-I-N, look back in Ephesians. When I got saved, I have redemption through his blood. That dealt with S-I-N, that's gone now. But I got a friend's benefit. God also forgave me of my S-I-N-S. Some of y'all were there when it happened and you hope nobody ever finds out you were there my pastor Dr. Jimmy Robbins used to say isn't it amazing what God can't remember and what we can't forget amen 
I got a double benefit. God not only canceled my sin debt, but he forgave me of my sins. And he did that according to the riches of his grace. Well, you say, that fellow's beyond the grace of God. He's beyond the great ransom. Where does the Bible say that? Where does the Bible say it? Well, the Spirit of God not always strive with man. We're not living in the antediluvian age. That verse was already fulfilled in the Noahic flood. Now give me another verse. Let's try again. Get into context now. There's nobody beyond the great ransom. Because the grace of God is rich enough to forgive all sin. All right, verse number eight, let's hasten. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom. Can you think of anything any wiser than justification by grace through faith? And prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. I wish I had time to develop that mystery. Maybe if, if the Lord works it out and I come back, I'll preach to you one night from Ephesians 3. The word mystery is used three times in that passage. Man, I'm thrilled to develop that in your hearing. The mystery of his will according to his good pleasure wherein he hath purposed in himself that in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth even in him. Now here's the fifth birthright. Here's number five. Look at verse 11. In whom also we have obtained an inheritance. Now if you're an heir, Brother T.R. and I have been talking about this. I've never preached on being an heir in the scriptures. We are heirs, heirs of God, joint heirs. I never have preached on that. Now I was talking to Brother T.R. the other day. I said, you need to think about that some. It is impossible for you to be an heir without an inheritance. You are an heir to an inheritance. I have an inheritance. Now, an inheritance is not a reward. Let's say a child is born. This individual young fellow grows up, and he's a studious young man. He goes off to college, burns a midnight oil, graduates with honors, and works 50, 60, 70 hours a week. And by the time he's 40 years old, he has a million dollars in the bank. That's not an inheritance. That's the reward of his labor. But let's say his daddy dies and the estate of his daddy is divided up and the will is read and in the will he is remembered for a million dollars. That, now he's got his own million. But if his daddy divided up the estate and said, I want to give Junior a million dollars in cash. Is anybody here that would turn that down? I'd be willing to give the IRS half of that. Just imagine what I could do with the rest of it. That million dollars, he's now got two. One million was from the sweat of his face. That was his labor. But the other million was an inheritance and he didn't labor for that. His daddy labored for that and gave it to him. At the judgment seat of Christ, every one of us are going to be disappointed. Well, you think about the materials, there's only six of them, wood, hay, and stubble, gold, silver, and precious stone. We have hay by the acre, wood, by the linear foot and stone by the ton. We have gold by the ounce, precious stones by the carat, and silver, of course, by the ounce. There's much more hay and stubble than there is gold. There's going to be so much fire at the judgment seat of Christ Some immature believers are going to think they're in the wrong place. Y'all will get that tomorrow. 
There's going to be a lot of fire at the judgment seat of Christ. I have everything Jerry Clower ever produced. I have everything Jerry Clower produced. Some people say Jerry Clower was a comedian. That is not true. Jerry Clower was a southern philosopher. Man, I've driven all night, all night, leave a revival meeting, drive 600 miles to get home. About 3 o'clock in the morning, I can feel them coon dogs rubbing up against my leg while Jerry Clower be keeping me awake in the car. Knock him out, John. It won't be long. <laughs> Jerry Clower was sitting at home. One day he tells this story. Sitting at home. One winter he was off the road for several weeks and he had his Bible open. He's pulling the leaves out of the front of his Bible. Putting them, throwing them in the fire. His wife walked in and said, Are you crazy? What are you doing? That's God's holy word. What are you doing? He looked at his wife and he said, well, every time I'd give $1,000 to a missionary, I'd write it in my Bible. Every time I'd go on a mission trip, I'd write it in my Bible. I'd go on a mission field and give the money to build a building, and I'd write it in my Bible. And he said, I'm afraid when I get to heaven, the Lord won't have as much in his book as I've got in mine. So he's pulling, that, pulling all that out and throwing it away. That's right. Now, we're going to have a lot of our works burned up. But none of us are going to be empty-handed. You're not going to be walking around in heaven with your hands in your pockets because you have an inheritance. And you don't work for an inheritance. You're born into an inheritance. And you'll be able to praise God for that inheritance. We all will wish we had done more but we'll still have an inheritance. Then notice again with me, please. This inheritance being predestinated, God's already got it worked out. I'm already named in the will. Being predestinated according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his own will. I have the inheritance today that I'll have in heaven if it's 40 years before I get there, it's already predetermined now. You might lose your rewards, but you won't lose that. Now notice this order of salvation. This is a beautiful thing. Verse number 12. That we should be to the praise of his glory, not to the praise of our own glory, that's why God generally takes the worst deserving and puts them in the best light. Not many mighty are chosen. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. That's why Paul could say, when I am weak, then I am strong. That's the second time that phrase, by the way, to the praise of the glory of his grace, verse 6. And now in verse number 12, six verses later, that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted Christ. That's how a man is saved. He is saved by trusting in Christ. Now you either believe that Christ paid your sin debt or you don't. One or the other. I trust Jesus Christ. I trust him to this degree. If I die and go to hell, I'll die and go to hell trusting Jesus Christ and his work on the cross as the payment for my sin. And according to a King James Bible, I can't go to hell trusting Jesus Christ. All right, that word trusted is used again. In whom ye also trusted. Now there are three things here in the order of salvation. I don't know why these are so difficult. I hear some men and they got 19 steps to being saved. Well, you got to get up and go down, go over yonder and come back and backtrack and go down under the hill and go up over the bank and you got to hear angel wings flutter in your ears and you got to see a great light and hear a great noise. And where does the Bible say that? One old boy came down to the altar to get saved, prayed for a while. A man knelt down beside him and said, Son, just hold on now, hold on. He'd be all right, hold on. He prayed on for a little while and the man knelt down on the other side. He said, Turn loose, boy, just turn loose. Notice this order, and I think this is why evangelism tarries. 
in this Laodicean church age we're in. These three things. Watch it now. In whom you also trusted, number one, after that ye heard the word of truth. That word of truth is the gospel of your salvation. Now wait a minute. That didn't say after you heard 52 salvation sermons. But the word of truth. I don't accept the idea that somebody can sit in a fundamental Bible preaching Baptist church for 40 years and be lost. Now hear men say, now R.A. Torrey said that 85% of the people in our churches are lost and I'm going to preach tonight. And they try to upset God's people and get them to the altar to make a new profession. Well, I don't agree with Dr. R.A. Torrey. By the way, Dr. Torrey did give the Pentecostals their theology on the Holy Spirit. He referred to the filling of the Holy Spirit as the power of the Holy Spirit. He got those things messed up. The Pentecostal, you read what he said in what the Bible teaches, it's exactly what Kenneth Copeland teaches. Well, Dr. So-and-so said that 75% of the people in our churches, I don't believe that. Not in Bible preaching churches. If the Bible is preached in plainness and purity, the unregenerated will either get in or get out. The hearing of the word of truth will become the gospel of your salvation. Now here's the problem. I hear a lot of preaching. I hear a lot of preaching. But I can count on one hand the men that come on WTBI radio, our gospel radio station in Greenville, that I would say that man's a Bible preacher. That man is a Bible preacher. Among those would be Oliver B. Green. Don't tell me a man listened to Oliver Green 40 years and something not happened. I hear a lot of preaching, but I hear a lot of preaching about this. I hear a lot of preaching about that. I heard a man the other day, and, and in my mind after listening to him, man, this guy's an opportunist. He's looking for an opportunity. It's all about him, what we're going to do, what we're going to say, where we're going to go. I thought Christianity was about the Lord Jesus Christ. Not about what we're going to do and what we're going to say and where we're going to go. We had a man at Tabernacle. He was a retired Navy man, a handsome, good-looking man. Had a big white mustache, full head of white hair, slim and tall. I think it's a sin for any man to be slim and tall when I'm short and fat. Say amen, T.R. <laughs> Mays was preaching one time. Mays Jackson said, say amen right there. We was riding down the road. My grandfather said, amen right there. <laughs> And I made friends with him. He was a personable fellow. His wife was not quite a charter member, but had been at Tabernacle a long time. I went to school with their daughters. Grew up with them. And I made friends with him, talked to him. One day my granddad called me over and he said, I notice you've been talking a lot to Mr. Tilton. I said, yes, sir, he's a nice man. I assumed he was saved. He came to church more regular than our deacons did. If we had revival, he was there. John McCormick come in, run a Bible conference, he was there. He was there for Wednesday night prayer meeting. If we'd have revival, he'd be there every night. Lost. My grandfather said, he's not saved. And I don't want you to say a word to him. You leave him alone. Now that'd mess up a bunch of, the, bunch of these fellows that, you know, they got a better way. They know how to do it. Young novices. Papa said, leave him alone. Papa knew more than I did. He knew the word would draw him. Man, he heard enough. He heard Mays Jackson preach while he was not saved. Heard John McCormick preach while he was not saved. Papa just let him sit over and soak with his wife. 
One Sunday morning, my grandfather finished preaching, and my grandfather generally preached doctrinal sermons on Sunday morning and evangelistic messages Sunday night. And he had preached some doctrinal message Sunday morning and we were waiting on the congregation. I was standing here and one of the other men on staff was standing here and I saw some movement off to my left. Now, Tabernacle is 70 feet wide. The building's 70 feet wide, 96 feet long. So it's a long way over there. And I stepped around, looked around the community and it was Mr. Tilton coming across the front of the church. With no disrespect to my brother standing here, but he wasn't going to wait on him. And I just walked real quickly I met Mr. Tilton right over there. I shook his hand. I said, why are you down here? And he said, Friday night I was laying in the bed. And I saw I was a lost sinner. And I got out of the bed and got on my knees and asked Jesus Christ to save my soul. And I want to be baptized on the perfection of my faith. That is the gospel. The word of truth is the gospel of your salvation. Secondly, watch what it says now. This is the order of salvation. So the first thing is the hearing of the word of truth. But those people going to hear Joel Osteen, they're not hearing the word of truth. Joel Osteen's not saved as far as I'm concerned. On it based on his own testimony. Number two, in whom also after that ye believe. I passed from death unto life when I believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Ye believed. Then number three. Ye were sealed, and that's the sixth birthright. Ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. Every born again believer is sealed unto the day of redemption. And we are sealed by the Holy Spirit. Justification is a judicial act. God justifies us in line with the work of Christ. But it is the agency of the indwelling Holy Spirit in the believer that energizes the new birth experience. The energy and the power you and I feel from being born again is the work of the Holy Ghost. And the Spirit of God is a seal that I won't fall out by the wayside, but I'll arrive at home at destination. The redemption of the purchased possession is not taking place yet. So I have an earnest deposit on my soul. Now, I don't know if Paul was a real estate man or not. Y'all have to forgive me, but my mother and dad both were in the real estate business. And earnest is a vital part of a real estate transaction in South Carolina. I'm not familiar with your real property laws in Tennessee now, so I, I don't know exactly how your contract law works, but I know how South Carolina contract law works. When I was a kid, I used to go with my dad. And he'd show a farm or a piece of land. He'd put me up on his shoulders. I'd love to ride on my dad's shoulders again. He put me up on his shoulders. I didn't know a man could sweat like my dad sweated. I just didn't know. I mean, he didn't sweat. He leaked. <laughs> my dad would sweat so profusely that I couldn't keep my fingers locked on his forehead. My pants would be wet, back of my legs wet from the sweat on his shoulders and back. I'd love to have some of that sweat on me again. Now, I miss my daddy. I miss my daddy every day. I'm going to see him again. We're going to shake hands. And I'm going to hug his neck. Amen. Some of you men miss your daddy too, don't you? That's right. My dad would walk the parameter of a piece of land. He'd show it to a man. Here's the lines right here. And work our way back around. they come back down to the car. Man say, I want to buy this piece of property. My dad say, do you have any earnest money? Man say, well, I've got $500. Dad say, that'd be enough. How things were much different back in those days. A contract was one page. No disclosures. A simple purchase and sell agreement. John Doe will give 
so-and-so $50,000 for a piece of real estate, piece of property, tax number 123.12.123, also known as 123 River Road. And that man would give my dad $500. And my dad would give him a copy of the contract and a receipt for his cash. The moment in South Carolina, the moment you put earnest money on a piece of real estate, you have equitable title then. Not legal title, you can't move in. But if somebody comes along and says, tells the owner, I'll give you 10000 more than that fellow that you just signed a contract with, I'll be delighted for you to get 10000 more, but a judge, I'm going to plead to a judge that I get half of it and my $500 back. Because you have equitable title. Nobody can bump you out of the way. Now you get your money up, go down to the bank, borrow the money, and that used to be a lot simpler. The last mortgage I got, Judy Stokes was my banker. And she was a high society, smart woman. But she was good to me. And I got ready to buy the house I live in now and I had to borrow $122,000. And I'm self-employed. I got all my tax returns and I pay my taxes. She called me on the phone. She said, Ben, I just want to ask you one question. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, if I give you this loan, are you going to buy that house? And I said, yes, ma'am. If you'll lend me $122,000, I gave $144,000. I had the balance in the bank for the down payment. I said, if you'll give me $122,000, I'm going to buy that house. She said, that's all I want to know. And I went down there two days later to sign the loan. She had out beside my name, Ben Carper, income 0.00. She got on the phone and told somebody up the ladder, said, give this preacher that loan, he'll pay it back. And they had a little understudy there to sign the papers, and he looked at it and said, well, we, we got a problem here. You don't have any income down here. I said, Judy Stokes wanted it that way, now just let me sign before you change your mind. Things were a lot easier. You go down to the bank and get you a loan. Banker says, man, I've known you 20 years. You want to buy, I want to buy one, two, three River Road. No problem, $50,000. I'll lend you 45. You got five for down payment? Yeah, I do. I got 4,500. The real estate man's got 500. Sure, I'll give you a loan. And you go to the closing and your $500 earnest secured that transaction from the time you signed that paperwork on the trunk of that man's car until you got to the lawyer's office to take legal title, that $500 secured that property. When God saved me 43 years ago, he put an earnest deposit in me, the blessed Holy Ghost, and he will guarantee that I get home and get a glorified body. And when the transaction's finished, you don't need any earnest money because you've got legal title. When I get home, I won't need the Holy Spirit dwelling in a glorified body because I'll be like Jesus. I'll have a body just like him. Every born-again believer has that. That's six birthrights. Tomorrow night, we'll see four more in chapter number two, and then we'll see our text. And the text is almost an anti-climax because all Paul says is, y'all walk worthy of this. Man, when I look at what the grace of God's done for me, I'm kind of like Isaiah. I cry out, woe is me. After all the grace of God has done for us, woe is me. Man, isn't it good to be saved? Praise God. Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Well, let's stand together, please. Our Father, we thank thee now for thy goodness. We thank thee for the Lord Jesus.
We do thank thee for these great birthrights we enjoy. We thank thee that we are members of his body. We are part of the family of God. We have been born again. And I pray, Father, forgive us. We confess our flesh is weak. We look through a glass darkly. Our understanding is dim. But you love us just the same. And I pray, Father, that you would so work in our hearts as a result of this meeting that by the grace of God we would earnestly desire to walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called. While the heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. If you're here tonight, you've never been saved, you can be saved tonight. The grace of God is sufficient. You can be saved tonight. I would urge upon you, if you're not saved, step out from where you are. We'll take a King James Bible and show you how to be saved. If you are saved, rejoice, rejoice. But if God has spoken to your heart, you'd like to come pray as a believer. God has spoken to you. We invite you to come. We're going to sing a stanza or so. If you need to come pray, we invite you to come. What do we have here? Good brother, 365. 365 we're going to sing. If you need to come pray, just slip out from where you are. You want to come talk to the Lord. Lord, help me now. Help me. Give me grace. Help me to walk worthy. With the Lord in the light of his word, what a glory he sheds on our way. While we do his good will, he abides with us still, and with all who will trust and obey. Sing it now. Trust and obey. For there's no other way to be happy in Jesus but to trust and obey. Second stanza, second stanza. Not a shadow can you come rise, now, slip out from where you are. Not a cloud in the skies, but his smile quickly dries it away. Not a doubt nor a not a sign or a tear can abide while we trust, trust and, and obey. Everybody, trust and, and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus, but to trust and obey.